And we are recording. All right, Mr. Boobles, kick us off, man. All right, so this week we have Woody Zool on the podcast with us. Um, so for those who don't know, Woody is one of the people that created mob programming back at Agile 2015. And and um, he's he's been a developer, been a leader in organizations before, and he's been an entrepreneur for basically his whole life. We were just talking about that before we got started. So um, Woody, maybe just for those who haven't heard the story, maybe you could just give us a little background of like, how did mob programming start? And and um, like, how did it morph into what it is today? Well, that's a great place to start. So we actually, the, the team that I worked with where this originated uh, was a team that was focused on learning how to work well together. Uh, they were, I was hired by the company that uh, to be the manager of a team. And this team was not doing well and they wanted someone who could manage this team into doing well. And I believe that's not possible. I believe that what we can do is give uh, give the team or the, the people involved the ability to manage themselves. Matter of fact, I told them in my interview when they were interviewing me, they said, you know, we have this team, they're not doing very good. And uh, we, you know, we don't, we're not sure what to do with them. And I said, well, you know, uh, a team that's not doing well is because they're not being managed well. And so this is your fault. And uh, so if you want to hire me, uh, I think I can work with almost anybody. And this team seems like a bunch of bright people, but I'll have to insist on no interference. You can't tell me what to do or what you want to have happen. The team's going to figure that out. Rather than control this team, we need to liberate this team. And then they'll figure out the best way to work for this mix of people. So that's that's kind of how it is everywhere. You can't you can't take a system that worked somewhere else and bring it and say, oh, I know the system that'll work, unless we move out to a very, I would say, external uh, meta level of thought. That means if, if the work here is not going well, it's the system of work probably that's the problem, but you mm-hmm. can't fix a system within itself. In other words, if, you know, I like to use this example as a human, you know, I really like having an opposable thumb. I, I just love it so much. I wish they had given me two opposable thumbs. Wouldn't that have been really great? But that's not how our system works. So I can't change the system to have two opposable thumbs on my hand. I might be able to find a doctor who's advanced enough to do that for me. But the system itself can't change itself. What has to happen in this case is a couple systems out is this whole idea of maybe evolution or things over time. So if at some point the system decides, hey, this little thing you're starting to grow over here is becoming more and more useful, and it then, you know, so over a thousand, uh, thousands of years, maybe two or three million, I don't know how long it takes, We'd have to do an experiment to find out. And um, yeah, so then, you know, so this is the idea. The system itself, where the work's being done, is where we often try to fix the system. We've got to move out a bit. So this team, uh, we'd spent six months. Uh, this was back again in 2011. I got hired there like the very end of April. And then by about almost this time, it may have been within a week or two of this time right now, nine years ago. We accidentally uh, started mob programming. And the way it happened was one of the team members uh, was working on something and they were having trouble with it. And they asked that we gather the whole team together to look at it so you know pe- different people could give advice on what we might want to do. And what they were really hoping was we would find a few more people to work on it with them so that they could uh, interact with a group thinking about this thing. But instead of talking about how we would do that, we just started doing that. So we sat down, the the person started showing us the code. Somebody on the team almost almost immediately said, uh, could you scroll down through that method a little bit so I could see what's there? Scroll down again. You scroll down some more. Please scroll down a little more. Well, if you've got to scroll down more than once on a a method or a function or whatever, it's way too big. And we could see this code was in terrible shape. And we started working on it. And that style of working was based on a mechanism we were using to study together. And this was a kind of a coding dojo. And this particular kind of coding dojo Mm -hmm. would have one person at the keyboard, everybody else looking, we used a projector, looking at the code. And and we would rotate the person at the keyboard and the person guiding the person at the keyboard. We used this thing called driver 
navigators, mm -hmm. uh, but it was really driver and navigator at that time because we were just switching the pair out every few minutes. So this was all accidental. Six months of studying once a week for three or four hours together, looking at code problems, uh, trying exercises to improve our skills, plus having somebody needing the help of the rest of the team to look at something, and it just kind of evolved or it just it emerged out of that. And that one day, in about two hours of sitting there together, uh, talking about the code and then starting to work on it, uh, we realized we wanted to keep doing this. At the end of the two hours, somebody came into the room we had reserved, and said, hey, you got to get out of here. We've got this room reserved for a meeting now. And instead of going back to our cubicles and our desks, which we could have done, somebody said, let's just go find another room and keep doing this. It was too much fun. It was too uh, effective. It was, we were all learning a lot. Uh, we were getting very high quality out of what we were doing. Everybody wanted more of it. So it, was, it wasn't like somebody invented this. We didn't go in one day and say, you know what we should do is invent a way to have more than two people at the computer so that Woody can go around the world training people in how to do that thing. You know, it wasn't that kind of a thing at all. It was just purely by accident. Yeah. We had been teaching ourselves for that six months to do a very short retrospective at the end of each day and ask mm -hmm. ourselves what went well today and then respond back to ourselves. How can we get more of that tomorrow? And so this was just an outgrowth of those things. And it was more, but, but that was the main things that we were learning to work well together. We were reflecting daily. Uh, we were getting good at looking at code problems and then it just became, so that's mob programming kind of how it originated sort of in a nutshell. And then how did it expand past that company? Well, this was an interesting thing as well. Uh, I don't know if you know of Llewellyn Falco. Llewellyn's a, a, a software developer, and he's a coach mostly now, helping people get you know, improve their skills. He's extremely uh, bright and capable programmer and knows, and he's always on the cutting edge of stuff. Well, we had brought him in to do some training on some test-driven stuff. And he noticed how we were working. Everybody's sitting at one table with looking at basically the same screen. Now, he and I had been doing these coding dojos at work at, um, at uh, user groups and little uh, conferences and so on. So we both kind of were experimenting with this. Matter of fact, he had taught me the basic idea of it, which is for an idea to go from someone's head into the computer, it must go through someone else's hands. And that little mechanism is what allowed me to become a much better pair programmer. And it's what we were using for our mob programming, which we don't, I think at that time we were, weren't really calling it mob programming. So he came, gave us uh, the training, and then he started telling people at other companies, you should see what these crazy guys down in San Diego are doing. And they would call us and uh, they would ask him, well, what are you doing? How do you do it? And we just say, come over. Spend a couple of hours or a day with us and, and you'll see what it is because it's hard to explain. But then um, I would say by a year, about a year after that. So I'd say people start finding out about it in early 2012 to mid 2012. And then uh, by early 2013, uh, people were asking me to submit conference talks on it. So it went rather quickly. It's like, you know, we didn't set out to do so. We didn't think anyone would be interested in this. It wasn't like we were going, hey, we should tell people about this. It just was something we were doing. Llewellyn's sort of a connector. He's like a super connector because he goes to so many different things. He, he's always watching for interesting things. And, uh, yeah, so that's basically how did it get to other people. Then somewhere in 2012, some folks in um, Sweden started experimenting with it. They had seen this little... Near the end of 2012, probably October-ish, September-ish, uh, I was invited to go speak at a conference about learning and team learning. And uh, in just a little part of it, we made a three-minute video of us mob programming. It was a time lapse of us. And so I put that on YouTube, and then people started uh, ridiculing us. And uh, But that just got more interest from folks. And these folks in Sweden started... Uh, experimenting with it too. So within, uh, by mid uh, 2013, uh, I was getting invitations to go speak in Europe. And hmm. 
So that was interesting stuff. I'd never been to Europe. I'd never been outside of North America. I'd been to Canada and Mexico, and in between, you know, mostly U.S. And then uh, I ended up uh, getting invited to this thing in, in Malmo, Sweden. It was called um, Ordev. It's right on the sound, but next to, you know, across the water is Copenhagen. They invited me to come speak, and I said, yeah, I would love to, but I can't afford a trip like that, and uh, where would I stay, and all this sort of stuff. I said, no, no, we'll pay for you to fly here. We'll give you a room for a week. Uh, you just give a couple talks, and they asked me to talk about mob programming and no estimates. So they said, just give us some, you know, like a description of the talks. And I sent that in to them, and they um, they sent me a note back and say, this is too mild. Make, make it sound more controversial. <laughs> so I rewrote it in a more spicy manner, like uh, just because that's what they wanted. And um, and that was a miracle. I, I don't even know what happened. I got to, to Malmo. Uh, the rooms were packed. I'd never spoken in front of, say, more than 20 or so people in my life. I spoke at the Scrum gathering in 20 earlier in 2013 i guess it was and there were like five people in the room to hear about mob programming that was comfortable for me <laughs> here's like two or three hundred people and it's, it's jammed and uh it was it was a real change for me but i, I got through it somehow yeah yeah and so there it is so, so I thought it was 2015 that you were doing some a big talk at Agile 20, 2015. Did that not happen, or was I thinking of something else? Was Agile 2015 in Washington, D.C.? Where was that one? It might have been. I'm trying to remember. It was in one of those cities where there's a lot of people. Yeah. 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 <laughs> one of those. Let's see. 2015, was that um, – I think Nashville was 2015. Yeah, it was Washington. It was 2015. I just Googled it. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, but that was like, I had, so I had already spoken at, at Agile 2012, which is where the first talk on mob programming happened. Mm. And that was purely by accident. Uh, again, I was there to talk about approval testing, uh, which is a test framework that Luan Falco had, um, that Luan Falco had uh, created. And uh, while I was there, people started coming up to me and asking me, what's, what's this mob programming? And we weren't really calling it that at that time. I think we were calling, I was trying to call it a whole team approach, to software development. And, um, but I put together a talk. I said, look, I can't explain this over and over and over. Uh, I'll put a talk together. I put like 10 slides together with some pictures of the team. They sent me, I sent them an email, take a few pictures and send them to me. Make me a list of like the 10 or whatever things about this you want to share. And then I just kind of went through that. At the end of that, the questions that I was asked, uh, which were quite a few, I wrote them all down and then I included them in my talk. So over the years, every time someone asks me a question I haven't tried to answer in my talk, I'll, uh, I'll write it down. and Then I can include it in the next talk. And pretty soon it built into two talks and really three or four talks now because there's too much material to do in one, you know, an hour or less talk. Mm -hmm. So I've been doing all the talking here. Well, I mean, you're welcome to ask me questions and I'll just keep going forever. Well, yes. So Jeff and I, we were on this kick of pairing not too long ago. I'd say it actually was a few years ago. We were giving talks at a lot of conferences about like, let's bring back pairing because like people just weren't pair programming anymore. And at least the clients we were going to, and because um, mob programming was a little too radical for people. So we thought, well, let's start with pairing. And let's take pairing and let's do it outside of programming. Like, why can't product owners start pairing? Why can't scrum masters? Why can't other people inside the organization start pairing and learning different things? There's so much to learn from working with somebody and having two minds working on a problem instead of one. And one of the questions that we got all the time, but why would I pay two people to do one person's job? And I can only imagine you get that question for why would I pay, you know, one person for a whole, what a, you know, pay a whole team to do what one whole person can do. Yes. Um, so I, I'm curious how you would answer it. And then we can tell you how we answered that question. And well, you compare know, notes. So that was one of the first two questions I was asked in that very first talk. The other question was, uh, what's the right number of people to have on the team? Both of these uh, indicate to me a mindset that really 
is far distant from an agile mindset. Mm-hmm. So the one about the what's the right number of people, it has nothing to do with the number of people. Uh, you know, like a sport, it's like there's nine people on the team. You know, it's like, well, okay, that's, you know, that's the rules of a sport. But we're not doing something with rules. What we're doing is trying to find out how to work effectively. So if we start with that question, it, it's like, what's the right number of people to have on the team? It's we have to understand what is it we're trying to accomplish when we collaborate. Now, most people, when we, let's make an example of a collaboration. You're moving. Jeff and Jeff uh, are are going to load a truck with stuff. And Jeff uh, has a refrigerator. And the other Jeff got invited because he's got a pickup truck (laughs) and some muscles. And so we're going to get the refrigerator down three flights of stairs. So that takes a kind of collaboration that, um, that is way beyond just simple, let's take a walk. So when we when we collaborate, we have to find a protocol, a way to work with each other. We have to find a way to communicate. You know, no, the other left. You hear that one all the time. <laughs> yeah. It's like, no, no, set it down, set it down, set it down. You know, you're yelling because if we don't set it down now, it's going to crush us to death. Things like that. So one little story I like to share from when I was a kid is uh, my folks you know, went to a church. A lot of uh, folks grew up in churches. Uh, and so I was, uh, we were in this church and it was part of a group, I think of a few other churches in that area and they bought some land or they had some land that they were going to make a summer camp and there was already some buildings up there. So they were going to go up and do this. So, well, how do you do that? You know, would you, you say, okay, I'm going to go up today and I'm going to uh, frame the thing. And then another day, somebody says, and then I'll go up and do the plumbing. And then somebody else says, and then I'll do the electrical. It, it's not that way at all. Matter of fact, in those days, if you got you know a semi-rural area, uh, out of the people going to the church, there's going to be a couple roofers and maybe a couple electricians and a couple plumbers out of the whole congregation. You've got all the skills and knowledge that you need, and you're going to go do it together. But it's not like a team of plumbers or a team of carpenters. It's a team of generalists with enough special knowledge. So let's say it's time to start the framing somebody who really understands framing is going to guide us. And the electrician is going to be saying, now we've got to make sure before we put the wall board on or whatever, uh, we've got to run the electrical wires. And the plumber is saying the same kinds of things, and they guide us. So this is very similar to what mob programming is about. But if we didn't have all those people there at the right moment, yep. we, yeah. wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to do this. If we couldn't do it in a timely fashion. So that that kitchen or that camp building would take weeks and weeks to build if we just went up and did it one at a time. So this is the beginning of thinking about what does it mean to collaborate? We started a company, we've built it to, let's say, 100 people. We've got 25 developers. We ask them to all come in and work. And then we tell them to sit in separate cubicles. And we tell them that they should only meet like uh, once a day or like in the old days, once a week or once a month. Uh, I worked at places where once the requirements were written, the developers never talked to the person who wrote the requirements. They weren't around anymore. They went off to some other, uh, you know, project or something. like that. So I hope this is making sense. If, if we yeah. tie it all yeah. back to this, it's like, well, we're not really paying five people to do the work of one person. We're paying five people to do the work of five people. Right. When we think that we will get five separate parallel tracks getting completed, we're just getting five things worked on in the least effective way possible, separate. That means we're going to introduce queuing, inventory, and other kinds of wastes, context switching, a multitasking. All these things are very uh, wasteful. Matter of fact, um, according to Reinertsen, I could turn around. I'm going to just, uh, just try to see. I've got at least two of his books right here. And the other one that I would really want to show is over there. So, oh, no, this is a good one. I actually accidentally grabbed this book. You've seen this book, I hope. Yep. That's odd. Let me look up here. Yeah. I've got three of his books. Uh, I believe there's three of them. I've read this book three times. I still don't understand most of it. It's really <laughs> packed with stuff. And I, But I refer to it often. There's a whole chapter on queuing. Mm-hmm. And he says queuing is the primary waste or the cause of the majority of waste in product development. Now, if we understand lean for manufacturing, 
In manufacturing, the weighting is, is, is really wasteful because as those parts are coming down the assembly line, you've got boxes and boxes of inventory that are just sitting there waiting to be put on. The, the queuing or the waiting for things to get there to do the work is very wasteful. But I think in product development, it's even worse. But it's easy to see it in, in, in uh, product manufacturing. It's much harder mm -hmm. to see it in software development. So if we don't understand queuing, we're we're going to or this type of queuing, waiting for something to work on it, waiting to get an answer to a question that's blocking us, waiting for another team to complete a responsibility, and so on and so on, something that we're dependent on. Uh, if we don't understand that, then it's going to seem weird that we put everybody together. But let's take that same manager. They need to get a heart, heart operation. We lay them out on the on the uh, operating table. And he looks around, he sees there's two doctors and four technicians. Why should I pay six people to do the work of one? I'm only going to pay for one person. If you want the rest of them here, you're going to have to pay for it. Do you think that that would be a reasonable thing? Definitely not. You know, so this is the thing. We need to gather together all the needed skills. Everybody's going to focus on their own specialty. But each individual is part of a bigger thing. and it's consider it a holistic uh, approach to work. That isn't just for surgeons. Uh, if you've ever worked on a, like I used to own a little company where we made signage and uh, we ha would have an installation crew. And so the installation crew is going to have a, a, a lift truck or like a, a boom truck of some kind. Maybe it's got a bucket in the end of it where a human would be. So are we going to send one person out on that thing? There's going to be the guy operating the crane another one in the bucket, probably a couple with ladders, maybe some people on the roof uh, lowering stuff out. You need the five or six people, an electrician or two. You need those people all there. Uh, if you were to say, no, let's do it separately, it's, it doesn't, why should I pay the work, uh, pay six people to do the work of one? You know, in so many things we do, that question just seems ludicrous immediately. And yet here in mm -hmm. software development, and I think it has something to do with how poorly we understand software development. And yeah. there's, a, there's a reason we, I think there's a, more than one reason, but I think there's a reason we misunderstand this. And that's because there's so dang much money in developing software that we can just waste most of that money and still make very high profit margins on the work we're doing. So we yeah. get these, um, we get these, I would say, uh, dysfunctional work mechanisms. There's somebody famous, a famous quote that said something, I, I should look it up, to the effect of uh, sooner or later, most companies are run out of time for succeeding in spite of themselves. In other words, they've been succeeding in spite of themselves until some catastrophe occurs or some something happens where all their good luck will not get them through it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One of the ways we answered that question was, uh, so we asked who the person is, like, what's your role? Let's just say they say, oh, I'm a manager or something like that. I'm like, oh, cool. Um, you know, we've hired people in the past. What's the fastest typing score you've ever got for a developer that you've hired? And they're like, what do you mean? And I'm like, well, if one, if the people are equal, right, then we're paying them to type. It's not thinking. It's just typing skills. And they're like, well, we've never tested people for typing. I'm like, Exactly. And then you go, okay, who's a developer in the room? Was usually the next question. And then we find a couple of developers and say, okay, if you, let's just say you were coding all day and you were solving a problem and you had something ready to go. And for whatever reason, you lost that code. You had it printed out in front of you. You just happened to print it out, but you lost it. And now you needed to retype it. How long does it take you to retype that? And we asked all the developers in the room and they're like, I don't know, 30 minutes, hour max, something like that. And we're like, okay. So if we're working an eight hour day, and only one out of those eight hours, we're actually doing the typing. The rest of the time, we're solving problems. Couldn't we solve problems so much better if we had two people working on that problem? Where you could, where you could get, you know, one plus one equals three, not two. Wouldn't that be the more effective way? And then we wouldn't be waiting for that skill. And we start talking about like all the delays and things like that. So that it has been one, you know, line of questioning that we've gone down. And I think it applies very well to mob programming as well. You know, it, we don't pay people for typing. We don't pay them for their hands. We are paying them for their head. And by slicing their head and having them work on many things or lose focus or not actually finish something, there's just so much waste that happens in organizations. Yes. 
Well, you know, Josh, Joshua Kurieski once said, uh, mob programming is like the continuous integration of ideas. Now, we can't take a group of programmers and say, we need a really great idea in the next two hours. If you bring them together, you have probably a better chance of that. But great ideas aren't something we can schedule for. So uh, that's an important thing to consider. It's like, what, did we create an environment where it's easy for people to come up with outstanding solutions? That's what we want to do. So I, I like to put it this way. We're not, with mob programming, we're not trying to get the most out of each person. We're trying to find a way to get the best out of each person. And that's a very different thing. The, the most, uh, you can measure how much production or how much productivity we have or how productive we are. You can measure that and deliver stuff nobody wants. The, that's, that's not a useful thing. Mm -hmm. What we really want, as a matter of fact, I, I worked at a place once where the boss would walk around, and if it didn't look like you were typing something, they would come over and talk to you. You know, it's like, why aren't you getting your work done? It's like, hey, this is mostly not typing, but mm -hmm. it, it seems like what programmers do is just say, oh, I got to do that, so I'll just put this code in. But that's not really exactly what's happening. But a lot of programmers give that impression so i can see where the misunderstanding might happen because it looks to you you know from an outside that's why i really love having a product owner on the team matter of fact i would argue this once a team is working together and working well it will be exposed where the biggest bottlenecks are and that's where you should be putting your effort instead of figuring out you know it's like there's a famous uh, example of a of a sales manager today sales were down so he goes and yells at the team. Marl sales were sales were up, so he knows the yelling worked. You see, but really, it's just it's just the um, natural ups and downs. Some days, you know. So we need to look at trends. It's something over a much longer period of time. The yelling actually doesn't help. The the the, the numbers would have gone up anyway. As a matter of fact, now everybody's trying to figure out how do I game the system so I don't get yelled at anymore. You know, we're introducing mm -hmm. this kind of dysfunction into our company when we follow that kind of an approach. Yeah. Have you ever been yelled at at work? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I used to yell at people at work. So that's not a good thing. No. One, one day it finally dawned on me, that's not a very effective thing. That was a long time back. And it took me a long time to figure out what the heck was wrong with me. That's what I used to ask other people. What's wrong with you? You know, but now I have to realize, no, it's actually me. I'm the difficult one. I've got to figure out what's wrong with me. So, yeah, that doesn't help. No. And that promotes that culture of fear, right? And when there's fear, people won't take risks. They won't try anything new. They won't try to innovate. They won't be creative. They're just going to look to be compliant and told what to do. And yeah, that's, that's really the management not material. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, right. Like, yeah, I guess if you want compliance, you'll get compliance, but you're not going to get innovation yeah. or creativity or, yeah. you know, Come you're not going to get right. You're not going to solve problems creatively. So, yeah. And, and so I know one of the things this, that you could do or Jeff and I have experience um, doing is having teams to change that culture and say, well, what would make that better? And we like the analogy of, well, when you partner a pair or a mob program, when you, if you had to, if you're a kid, I've got small kids and if they had to, if I told them, go walk through this woods and they go and you need to get to the end of this trail by yourself in the middle of the night, they'd be freaked out. They wouldn't do it. But if I said, Hey, your brother's going to go with you and he's going to hold your hand and you guys need to meet me on the other side of the woods. They have no problem. They'd go run right together, be skipping along, singing, telling jokes, and they'd have a good old time. Right? So with a, things that seem very scary by yourself and a partner and a group, also don't become very scary. They become a challenge. They become fun. They become exciting. Uh, and they provide that safety, right? That, that I think we look for as humans. So I think that's they another. Can. They, they can. They can, yeah. right. So that's something that we need to, we need to understand is that if you just take five people, put them in a room and say, you're now a team and you're mob programming, um, dysfunctions are going to happen and it could be really miserable. So we have to understand that we need to develop a protocol, a way of working with each other. How do we communicate? What's that going to be like? And one of the things we learned, you know, by doing our coding dojos, four, three or four hours a week on every Friday, we'd gather together in a room. And we had a very strict protocol that I used. As a matter of fact, it's where I first started using the idea of calling it mob programming was before we ever mob programmed. I, when I was doing the coding dojos at user groups, I would say, first, uh, this is sort of how it would normally go. I'm going to invite somebody up. They're going to sit down at the computer. And we're going to compare 
we'll pair program for a little while. And I would be the navigator, they'd be the driver, which means I'd have the idea we're gonna put in the computer and they would just be putting it in, following their own idea of how to translate what I'm saying into code. And then I'd invite somebody else from the audience to come down and sit and they would now do this together. And we're just mm-hmm. demonstrating the idea that uh, that I got from the well on, you know, the, 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 the idea is gonna go into the computer through someone else's hands. That means if we have the idea of what to put in the code, we step away from the keyboard and the other person sits down. Now that uh, really opens up uh, three or four things about communicating. One is we have to be good at explaining ourselves. Now I've seen it with pair programming and I've experienced it a great deal where someone is typing something in and we're not using this dynamic. Uh, they're typing in, they go, oh, I know what to do. They take the keyboard, they start typing in. The other person's watching and they're going, I don't really see where this is going. What, what are you trying to do here? Well, there's this universal hand signal that the person at the keyboard does. They put up their hand like, stop talking. You're going to distract me, you know? So they don't yeah. even want to say that because they don't want to lose their place. And you'll see, you'll see, you know, this isn't communicating. This is really some kind of a bizarre programming theater of some sort. And so the, the end result is that we're not really collaborating. We're each kind of thinking alone and trying to wonder when, you know, oh, I've got, I know what to do next, and we take the keyboard. So <laughs> learning to do this in the coding dojo, when I would present this at a user group, I would say, hey, now we're going to open it up. Everybody's going to join us. But to keep it from becoming chaos, we're, we're going to have a mob of people programming, but we don't want an unruly mob. We want a ruly mob. So I'm going to lay out the rules, and I had very strict rules. This isn't how we mob program. It was just how I did this type of coding dojo. The one rule was the only person allowed to speak is the one designated navigator. The driver's only job is to convert what that person is asking for into the code under the direction of that person. And everybody else who's going to participate keeps their mouth shut. They're not going to talk until it's their turn to navigate. And we rotate that every four minutes. The thing is, is that you now have to learn how to keep your mouth shut, difficult for some of us, how to listen to what someone else is saying. We had a couple of other rules. One was when you become a navigator, you don't get to say, I don't like what we've done here. Delete everything. We're going to start over. The rule was uh, you can refactor to get your idea across. If you have a better idea, experiment with it. And if the next navigator liked it, they might take it forward, but you're not allowed to delete code. We were always using test-driven development, which means you had to keep the test passing. So mm-hmm. as we rotated through this, we were learning those, those things, how to express our ideas clearly. And when you're working with a group, some people will be naturally better than others. And then they kind of act as models or mentors for the rest. Oh, I like the way they put that. We use the whiteboard. We take it to the whiteboard. That helps us communicate. We got something other. It's like a shared memory location where we can capture the current idea. But when we're, you know, and sharing it between brains. But when we're done, we just can erase it. We're learning how to listen to somebody else. And that's the biggest trick. There's a great book called uh, Time to Think by a woman named Nancy Klein, I believe. And she put a little hint in there that I've used quite a bit lately about listening. She said, she says, um, try to listen to someone as if the next thing they say will be the most important thing you'll ever hear. And that really puts you in a different state of listening. Now, her theory is if you listen well, it allows someone else to think better. If you listen really well and attentively ask the right questions at the right time, uh, they're going to be, this is a gift you're giving to the thinker. They're going to think better while you're the listener to them. So becoming good at listening, and that's something I've always not been good at, is is an important thing. If we're going to work as a group, we have to be able to, hear each other's ideas. One rule that we put in place, or I should say strict guideline, once we start mob programming is, you can never tell someone their idea won't work. If somebody's got an idea and you don't think it'll work, just keep it to yourself, let's try it. Always say, let's try it. Mm -hmm. If you try all the ideas, you will find out which ones are good and which ones aren't. I was was at a workshop in um, the UK and the manager came to me before we started and said, is these two guys on these teams, they are going to fight this the whole way. They think that they're always the best. They know what they're doing. But with that simple rule in place, at the end of the day, one of those troublemakers 
came to me and said, boy, I, these other people have some pretty good ideas. They never bothered yeah. to notice that everybody else has at least as good ideas as they have. Interesting thing. So something similar, but different, different context. When um, I was learning to teach Scrum from like from a training perspective or Kanban or other different things, I paired with people. And then when other people needed to learn, they paired with me as well. And I, and we, and I had a rule when people started pairing with me, and maybe Jeff even remembers me telling him this at some point, but the rule is we need to yes and each other. So you can't just say, no, you're wrong, Jeff. If you don't agree with me, say, yes, I agree with you, or yes, and this could also be applied in this context and give your right. reasons. But if you disagree, you really stop the conversation right there and you it right. makes it feel like a totally different environment and doesn't feel safe for you know the students probably even oh. and us as instructors, right? So here's the thing with the yes and, and I think it's a good technique, but often ideas take more than one sentence to share. And people often want to say their yes and in the middle of the idea. So that the idea might take three or four sentences and some time at the whiteboard before we can kind of get it expressed across. So rather than trying to build on an idea of that sort, we allow it to take its full course if we can't think of a really compelling reason not to just go ahead and take it to code immediately, Mm -hmm. uh, which hopefully we are resisting coming up with those reasons. The yes and will come after we got a chance to see it working. I watched one uh, uh, one of the teams uh, doing this, and what we found was that if you if you allow the idea of the junior person to be st- tried first, you'll usually get to a better solution. So rather than blocking ideas and thinking, like my, my dad used to say, um, there's a thousand right ways to do anything. He was an engineer. There's a thousand right ways to do anything. We should never think ours is the one right way because it's not. We probably have one of the, you know, middle tier of ideas anyways. We think it's a great idea. Now, another thing he used to say is, as soon as you have something you think will work, try it. And if it works, don't waste time trying to get a better idea because you can move forward now. You might come back later and say, hey, we got to change that. You'll learn more as you go. What am I things I say a lot is it's in the doing of the work that we discover the work that we must do. So we have to actually do it. This is the idea of a a wicked problem. Wicked problems uh, generally, uh, you don't even, you can't even really define the problem until you've started trying to to come up with a solution, so to speak. And that means you have to try some things to understand the problem. Mm -hmm. And then you might realize it's not at all what you thought. Well, I can go on and on with those kinds of things. So let's let's find some other path to take. So I was curious. I wanted to jump in here real quick. Um, so er- earlier we were talking the, the the history here, and you know, going back to 2012, now up to 2020. Hindsight being 2020, what are the things that you've learned since then that you wish you could jump in the DeLorean, hit 88 miles per hour, and go back and say, Woody? Here's some things that I want you to think about um, as you're just getting started with this. Like, what what were some of those scraped knees? Or so, what makes you think I hadn't already done that? Uh, maybe. So this is the thing. We, we, we where we're at is where we're at. So you know, there's there is a kind of a funnel thing, which is a uh, we're where we're at because of where we were. Mm-hmm. And so the main things that uh, that I brought to the team when the, the company that hired me was looking for a way to rescue a team that was not doing very well. I mentioned that already. The main thing I brought to the team was the understanding that most everybody involved in software development is pretty bright. And if you give them the opportunity to, to learn about continuous process improvement and things like that, uh, then they're just going to, they'll act on it and they'll make these things Happen. They just need to have the freedom to, to be able to use their ideas. I, I've, I've actually had this happen to me on a job once a few years back. I guess I was 27 or so. And uh, I noticed they were wasting wood in the wood shop. I was painting uh, stuff, and uh, but the people in the wood shop were just wasting materials. And I went in my boss and said, you know, uh, the first thing I learned in shop class was how to measure uh, a piece of wood to get the most use out of it. And they're not following those guidelines. They're really simple. And he said, we're not paying you to think. Go back and paint your sign. And so uh, I've actually talked to many other people who say the same thing. 
that they've had a manager tell them that. So this is the issue. I believe that the people doing the work are the ones who can figure out best how to do that work. And we just haven't given the freedom to do that. So I had already been through that for 20 years of learning those things. So now, 10 years after, I still am looking back and going, I'm glad I understood that when I got with this team. Matter of fact, it was getting with this team that was the culmination of 10 years of me trying to figure out how to influence change for the better when I was never really in charge of doing that. In my earlier years, I owned some businesses. I was always the boss, not necessarily a very good one, but trying to get better. When I start working for other people, then I could realize how faulty most of my thinking about management was. So uh, for 10 years, starting in 99, in fact, the very first contract I had when I started working for others was in 99, uh, doing software. And the, the first contract was three months. And it was for a guy who understood extreme programming, understood object-oriented programming. This was in 99. No Agile. There wasn't anything called Agile yet. There was people trying to come up with these Agile-ish things. And it was still a couple years later before Agile really uh, got documented as a thing. But I could tell what he was doing was really marvelous. And then the second contract I went to, which was a huge company. This first one was a tiny little group. Huge company. And I went there specifically because I thought, boy, if the little guys are so good, I'd love to see what the big guys are doing. So I went on to a a little uh, uh, project that was supposed to take three to six months with 200 developers. Like that clearly isn't going to happen. But I went into that looking forward to learning a lot. And then I realized I've got to. We've got to change this. This everybody was felt felt under pressure. People were working sometimes all night long. Uh, things got behind her and behind her uh, over time. I was there for six months. It was supposed to take three to six months. I left after six months because it was just ridiculously annoying to work there. And they kept going for another uh, year and a half after that before they really delivered the product. Uh, it was in, they, actually the failure of, of that company to not deliver that product into their internal use that caused them, I think, to eventually dwindle away. But anyways, the point being, um, I had spent 10 years trying to figure out how do we get these improvements. And I, you can see behind me uh, a few books, but I've got, uh, in, those, in the days before I could get everything on a Kindle, uh, or what, oh, I'm not allowed to say business names, right? So uh, on, on a little handheld device that has, uh, that has um, you know, book reading capability, I would buy the physical books. And a lot of them were very quite important to me. And as a matter of fact, I'm going to turn around and just say, for example, Teaming by Amy Edmondson. Teaming, uh, I bought the day it came out on Kindle and Audible because I was getting ready to get on a plane. And I, by the time I got off the plane, I had read the book, mostly listening to it being read to me. Point being, that I was studying this stuff and I was studying it in many different forms. Uh, trying to learn, have you, you know, uh, Linda Rising? Hey, she wrote the book uh, Fearless Change and More Fearless Change with her partner who writes books with her. Um, yeah, I was reading those kinds of things the patterns of change, the patterns of continuous improvement. I was reading everything I could about lean. Uh, so by the time I got there, a lot of the stuff that, that that I would have looked back 10 years and said, I wish I would have known this 10 years ago, I, I kind of had gotten this stuff. Now I was trying to prove it. Matter of fact, uh, uh, when I took this job, I was just waiting. I had a good job. I was looking for a bigger challenge. And uh, I let it be known to some of the people that I knew around the San Diego area that I would be, I would consider another contract. I went through seven different interviews over a, a, a year period at seven different companies um, looking for a place they would answer my questions the way I wanted them to answer. And so, so now looking back, I would start off, if, if I say, what did I learn in the last 10 years is that uh, I should have been doing this even 10 years sooner. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so if I'm looking back, it's like I kind of knew that teamwork was a good thing. I just can learn how to say it. It was hard to get people to pair program. Uh, you you were talking about people were less pro- pair program, but I I never really saw that. I've always seen it as a slight uptick. But for the first five years, you know, from two thousand, I think I learned pair programming in nineteen ninety 
eight or nine, for the first five years, it was hard to find somebody to pair with. And then for the second five years, it was hard to convince some company that we should be allowing pairing mm-hmm. and look at it as a, as a uh, less productive way of working. I think it was more productive. I'd gotten to the point by 2002 or three that I'd much rather pair because I knew I was going to have fewer problems that I was going to have, um, that I was going to have better solutions that it was going to be a stress-free day. Uh, yeah, there were a lot of good things about it. So yeah, I did start experimenting with group programming in 2005 or six in several different ways, a trio programming. But boy, when we stumbled upon the mob, what we are now calling mob programming, it was uh, it was a huge eye opener over the period of two or three hours. And then we kept working that way after that first two or three hours in 2011. Mm-hmm. Um, we didn't stop. We continued that way f- continuously. I want to go back to something you said a, a little earlier. You said all teams should be self-managed. And then before you kind of said uh, they should figure out how to do the work. And so when I hear the word self-managed, what I think of is um, who, what, and how we do the work. The team figures that out. But I don't mean self-governed. And so I just like I like to add that clarification. The governed, I think, is another thing you could do, but that's another level. And the governed, I mean by like hiring, firing, salaries, promotions, what any of that type of stuff. Um, do you have that same is that how you define it? Your also no, or do you define no. it differently? No, no, not really. So think about the company itself. It's self-organized, it's self-managing. The company is that already. You know, we don't bring in, say, okay, oh, we, we don't really know how to, uh, I don't know how to do the bookkeeping, so uh, we're going to have someone else do the bookkeeping. You know, somebody outside of the company. Now, a small company might do that. Mm-hmm. Uh, we don't know how to do our, you know, whatever it is. So I guess if we understand the core of what a business is about, much of what is there has got to be somehow included in the business. So what about the hiring and firing? Who better would know about who to hire or fire than maybe the teams themselves. I'm not saying yes or no to any of this. I'm just, I would pose these as questions. Who would yep. know better than the team itself? So I'm going to, I've been showing you books. Give me a moment. I'll see if I've got another one I can show you. I've read it uh, quickly because I just got it a couple weeks ago. I know I'm showing lots of books. Moose Heads on the Table. This is by a woman named Karen. Uh, Tenelius and Lisa Gill. She's in Sweden. Can I tell a little bit of her story? You yeah, a go for it. Um, I heard her on a podcast uh, three years ago, I think. I said, I want to meet this woman. And I knew I was headed to Stockholm. And I tweeted out, hey, does anybody know this lady? Uh, I want to meet her. Could you introduce me? Somebody, one of my uh, people that I've actually had, that had a company where I was uh, – going to do a workshop. So yeah, I know her. So we, she, he got us connected up through email and I met her uh, when I got there as soon as I could. We spent two hours talking and I may misunderstand this story, but this is how I understand it. She had started uh, learning to be a manager, going to school for it, I believe. Working as a, a manager, she noticed that people um, didn't enjoy being managed as she started looking for better ways, so we had a more enjoyable work environment and had some real good success with it. People started at, and she was working for a firm, I don't know what they were managing. People started asking her, could you come and help do this for us? And she would go do that. And then they went and take her advice. So she had this very bold plan. And this was just over 10 years ago, must have been 12 years ago. She decided that she would buy a company that needed to take her advice, but wouldn't take her advice, and then kind of prove how this stuff works. And she did this, I don't know how many times, more than just once. After I heard her story, I asked her to come and be the keynote speaker at our mob programming conference in Boston, because it's just a brilliant idea. If I was 20 years younger than I am right now, and somebody came to me at my age uh, back then and said, hey, I've got this idea, let's buy a company and manage it right, um, I think I probably would have, as long as we could find the right people to help finance it, I would have jumped in on that. What a great, bold move to prove your ideas. So 
So I'm not necessarily saying everything she's doing is correct, but the basic idea of the book is the people doing the work are the ones who should be managing this work, self-organizing. And if this, so that's self-managing. I don't think we need to have people hiring or firing. I don't think we need to have people doing most of the things the way that we currently do it in companies. That's all just a contrivance, a contrivance of human, humans, that this is what we think should be done. Where did all these ideas start? How did we start doing this? We could go to some pretty dark places because that's where the beginnings of this stuff is. I've got another book. Unfortunately, it's not here. I can turn around and grab it. But it's called uh, Accounting for Slavery. Mm -hmm. It's basically a book about the accounting practices that came into place when people were trying to manage these uh, West Indies uh, plantations. Uh, that's not the way we should be thinking. You know, that was a bad thing then, and it's a bad thing mm -hmm. now. So uh, not to get too much into that, but that could be a whole conversation someday. We need to be really careful. Why do we do the practices we do? Most of them are wrong, and yet we do them. Why do we do estimates in software development? Uh, why do we, um, well, there was used to be the waterfall, uh, way of working. I don't know if there's too many still doing that, but why did we do that? You know, we need to question these things. There's nothing that we're doing that can't be uh, discarded and replaced with something better or at least uh, be improved. Yeah, we have to be, there's nothing that we should say that's how it is. It's just the way we think it is. So I got a question. So how would, how would you recommend tactically inviting people into your organization? And, and asking them to leave your organization. Um, just wondering on some ideas that you had that, you know, maybe are a little bit more humane as you're going back to like some of these practices that we have and why we have them. So simply understanding that we are all leaders is a starting point. We can say that person's a natural leader or that person's a thought leader or whatever it is. But it's all the other voices that are really more important to be to hear. A person who comes across as being a bold leader usually uh, will have what I would consider limitations that we really shouldn't um, give into. So we're giving up our uh, ability to have a, the agency that we actually have when we expect others to do that work for us. We're going to tell you what time to come in. We're going to tell you who you work with. We're going to tell you what you work on. We're going to tell you the artifacts you need to create, the kinds of meetings you need to go to, on and on and on. And that is all assuming something. It's assuming that we already know the right way to do these things. And we don't necessarily. Matter of fact, it's every brain in the company uh, that we need to learn to, to use. Software is, development is full of smart people, but this goes with every kind of work. It's going to be rare that somebody can at least get themselves up out of bed and to work on time is smart enough to, to have brilliant ideas for us. If they learn to self-organize and self-manage, I'm not saying I have any answers for this. I do believe that there are answers. We, we need to improve. Most of the way companies are run is, um, is faulty. We can say, but that's what we have to do. But that right there is just, uh, that's, uh, that's st the status quo. The things are the way they are, so we're going to just keep doing it that way. I can ask a couple of questions. Okay. When we hire somebody, what are the qualities that we're looking for? And you can answer. What, what do you think? So me, I, I, I always look for, I love Patrick Lynchiani's ideal team player, humble, hungry, smart. So humble, team oriented, thinks about the group, right? Over themselves, smart, emotionally smart, not intellectually smart. We're talking about the emotional smart. They can read people. They can understand how they're influencing people when they talk to them. Um, and then hungry, they're hungry to learn and improve. Continuous improvement is really important to them. You told the story earlier about how like, you know, that never stopped for you and you just kind of had this as a hobby, but I don't think the world's slowing down anytime soon. And it just requires more and more learning. And we all have to take personal responsibility to do that. So I think those are the three main qualities I look for. Um, Jeff, what, what are your thoughts? Uh, you you pretty much stole exactly where I go with that as well. I I, I think those all three of them are really important. Um, you and I, and I think that's the ideal team player that it comes from. The yeah right. okay. Um, 
but but tied along right with that because you, you you said a lot of words earlier on that kind of were resonating with me. You 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 said dojo a number of times, and and dojo it, at least to me is it's just another name for a school. It's a place of continuous learning, and so I think that mindset going back into Hungary, but also just wanting to better yourself every day. You said you you ended the day with a retrospective, a way of how can we focus on the good and continue adding more of that, like that's a mindset that you're looking in somebody it's and and I didn't have this after when I first I, I, I often tell people this story when I graduated college I had the understanding that I was done learning I was done to apply everything that I had just spent the last few years learning and this I didn't need to read any more books because I was done with that and it probably took maybe three to five years before I actually realized that I was an idiot and there was a plenty more of stuff out there that I needed to, to start thinking about and, and gaining on. So that, I think just that growth mindset, that's something else that we've talked about quite a bit, but it all kind of resonates around the same thing. It's just a hunger for continuous improvement. Um, I, not to go too, too far with this ramble, but like over the past few years, um, that's one of the other reasons that I, I wanted to start this podcast with Jeff is like, I enjoyed so much of the learning that I was getting from podcasts. It was like, why, you know, we've got some knowledge to share. Let's see if we can get other really smart people to come onto the show and I can sit here and listen to them and take something of value away. And maybe other people could get something of value as well. Um, so I, I guess to, to kind of end this ramble, it that continuous mindset as well as hum humble, hungry, and smart. I think those are the things that I would look for bringing in somebody new. Okay, so the reason I want to ask that is because there's a flip side to it. The economy goes in the tank. You need to get rid of people. How do you decide who to get rid of? Well, context matters. I don't know. <laughs> I can't. I would say the, the ideal um, is transparency and the team figures it out. Um, but there's also, so we had, um, I'll tell another story for maybe some people haven't listened to this one or, um, maybe you haven't heard the story, but Rich Saradin, I don't know if you know, Rich, he joy Inc. Yeah. Joy Inc. Yep. And so he was telling the story, um, he was on a, f a few months ago of when COVID happened. So, I mean, their sales pipeline took a big hit and they had to do something drastic because they do pairing, right? Everything they do is pairing everything. They're always passing that keyboard back and forth. It's like the most COVID friendly environment you could think of. Right. And, um, and so the, he, they made him and his founder, James, they made a decision and, and uh, they've got different levels inside of their organization. And they decided to everybody founders are going to take no pay. They're going to get paid nothing during this time period. And everybody's going to move back down to that baseline. Number one, and everyone's going to take the same hit because we know our culture. We know that if you know somebody leaves, there's going to be the survivor syndrome. Like people are really going to feel guilty about their their friends, like their family, really there. And uh, so they made that call. So I don't. I think that's a pretty good model. Like if you have that culture, I think you could ask. But I don't. I think that um, you know. It depends on the situation in your context and your environment as well. Because if you ask a team where I only know, I'm the database, I'm the database team, and I only know the database team, I don't know anything else, it's pretty hard to ask them to make that call on their own. They don't, they don't have the full view of the whole system like we were talking about before. So, so what, what I'm kind of poking at here is that um, these are really imperfect systems. When we're going to hire somebody, we're getting a snapshot uh, view into what who they are, what they are. Unless we have an extended hiring system like maybe they use at Menlo Innovations where Richard Sheridan is, um, it's going to be hard to tell, hard to make the judgments. But I, I like to, I often like to put the two kind of the opposite situations. One is the hiring people, the one is having to get rid of some people. So uh, this is just totally hypothetical, but I'm going to, uh, that I want to share now. What I think is a possibility is that the people who aren't cut during those times are the ones who haven't made it clear that they're really valuable to the company. Those are the ones who are usually getting the most done and others are taking credit for it. So the people who stay are the ones who are good at taking credit for stuff they didn't do themselves. What if that repeats itself? We hire the people who are good at making it seem like they're good when they first interview. And then we get rid of the people who aren't promoting themselves very well. 
then we have like a, this continuous uh, vicious cycle going on. Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying whether this is necessarily true or not. I've seen it in certain situations and I suspect it happens more frequently. Uh, but that's just why I could probably come up. If we sat here for another hour, uh, I could probably come up with, uh, with you two. We could invent five or six other scenarios that could equally be as bad. So we don't have a really great system for either side of this. When we do performance reviews of individuals, we are often gauging them in such a manner that it discourages teamwork, that it discourages collaboration, that they're going to get the raise or the bonus or the promotion based on how they are perceived. And so they need to make it look like they're doing well. If somebody comes to them and asks for help, they may have to say, I'm sorry, I can't help you today. I've got to get this work done. It's got to indicate done on my list here uh, so that I can keep proving that I'm getting my stuff done on time. Mm -hmm. So almost all the work practices we have in place somehow started by somebody saying, how are we going to make sure everything's getting done and that people are uh, working hard and so on? And they end up changing almost immediately. This is the problem. If we attempt to change a complex system, then it will it will modify itself to not accept our change. So whatever we think that we're doing, the system will evolve around it to lessen or uh, remove that impact. A good example uh, would be uh, you know, like sales incentives and things like that. I I've seen, I actually experienced this a great deal at a place I was managing many years ago. They incentivized the salespeople in such a way that they were selling work that was not profitable for the company. But they didn't really understand how that could be, but that's what was happening. And mm -hmm. I've seen it in more than one situation. So Deming, is it probably yeah. uh, who would have said, uh, is Deming the one who said, uh, uh, there's no way that we can incentivize or, or... Well, I was thinking of the Deming quote that 95% of the problems are the system and only 5% are the people. Or... So that's the overarching concept. Yep. And that's right. It right there. So when we put a system in place that uh, that requires incentives, incentives to, uh, to succeed, then we are probably going to get a result that we weren't expecting. Danella Meadows, who wrote the book, a system thinking book, uh, has a really nice quote in there, basically that, if we attempt to change or influence the system, we will not get the result we want, except for maybe temporarily. So we are not going to be watching for the other things that are going to go down the tubes because we attempted to make this change that we thought would, would bring an advantage. So there's John Gall's book, uh, The System Bible. Uh, he talks about this to a great degree. He believes that all systems that are working started out as or a complex working system, start out as a simple working system. And a simple working system isn't a guaranteed thing. All systems start out simple and they, they may turn into working systems. They may not. For example, maybe there was some time way back there when we started having that second, you know, uh, thumb, but those people didn't survive. So we never got it, you know? So that's the, uh, that's the basic idea. So uh, yeah, yeah, if the system is constantly evolving, its main feature is that it knows how to perpetuate itself. And it will do whatever it can. We can't impose our will on the system. That's what we want to do. That's what mm -hmm. every transformation and every intervention and every, you know, uh, all these things people are trying to do right now, that's what they are. They think that they can change this place of work. Uh, the system in this place of work, and we're really not able to do that. We have to take a very different approach, or at least, you know, the the, the reason that I think uh, these things is because I've watched them, and then what are we going to do about it? And I've spent that 10 years trying to figure out how can we influence change without it blowing up on us? How can we influence uh, improvements without everything being destroyed around us? How many companies are failing right now due to this pandemic? Uh, they were succeeding in spite of themselves for many generations or at least decades. What's happening right now? I'm very thankful in some ways that I'm not, I, I'm sure many of the businesses I've had 
would probably not have gotten through a thing like this. Mm -hmm. My business were always quite small, you know, 10 to 15 people at the most. But if I gotten through a hard time like this, I would be, I'm pretty doubtful. that. <laughs> and we're just getting, we're just bordering on the depressing stuff. If you really want to get depressing, <laughs> we can dig into all sorts of things. Uh, there's lots to learn in this area. And this is why maybe the most important thing to me is those end of the day retrospectives for us. Five minutes was well invested every day to just say, how can we get a little bit of an improvement tomorrow? What can we do that gets us a little bit better tomorrow? And if we do that every day, um, we got those improvements. We had no idea it was going to end up with mob programming. Now, I'm not guaranteeing any of this. I could be completely wrong. In fact, I would argue this. Most of what we had success in, in coming up with mob programming, and that company still, uh, now I left there in 2015, and now it's five years later. They still, they've expanded the mob programming. All the teams are working that way. This, the thing is, is that how much of what we did there was just purely circumstance and just purely good luck, and not that I knew what I was doing. You know, that I knew that if we, my experience told me if we reflect frequently, and try to turn up the good on stuff, that's a good thing, good things will happen. But I have no mm -hmm. idea what those good things will be. I can't say, we're going to end up here. All I can say is, let's do stuff where we have an environment where it's potentially a better for having good things happen. That's maybe mm -hmm. the extent of the influence that I can have. Yeah, I would say that, you know, all the things that we've talked about, a, a recurring theme is moving from an analysis mindset of where you think you can figure everything out beforehand to a feedback mindset. And the faster you can accelerate that feedback loop of inspecting and adapting and changing where you're going, the more success you'll have. So you were doing that every day as a team thinking about it. You were also doing it every moment as you were coding and then yeah. like pass, passing, you know, the every four minutes when you pass the navigator uh, around, right? Um, and so you're learning really quickly and inspecting it definitely really quickly as a team and sharing skills and knowledge. And um, you don't have those delays in there. So I think that's how you, that's maybe one of the secrets of cranking up the good. I think that's one of your sayings, right? Crank the good up to 11, you know, well, from yeah, 10 to 11. Yeah. I think that's from spinal tap, but um, my, my idea is just let's continuously turn up the good. Ted Beck talked about turning everything up to 10. And some people say he said turn them up to 11, but I haven't found any documentation of that. Hmm. Definitely Spinal Tap, though. You've seen that movie, I hope. If you haven't, it's an arcane uh, reference. Okay, I haven't. So I was like, but Jeff's not to said he's seen it. So Yeah, us older funny. guys would have seen it. <laughs> I think YouTube's uh, videos are most successful when they're about three minutes at the most. So. Yeah, we it's we don't get a lot of traffic to our YouTube channel to be honest. Uh, but that's that's not what this is about, you know. E even if it's twenty people who get value out of the conversation, that's that's what we're going for. Um, so it's it, you know it, it, we're we're value based. We don't do any marketing. We don't do anything like that. Everything's very organic, and we love it when people listen. And um, you know, if they don't, that's fine too. Um, we we could Jeff and I get value out of these talks. So I have a. Uh... Uh, my daughter bought me this book. Uh, it seems like it was for Christmas. It seems like it was at least 10 years ago, but I might be jumping back. Oh, yeah, it was uh, 2005. Uh, Team of Rivals. This is about essentially, you know, Abraham Lincoln and the group he put together to, uh, to assist him in a very difficult time in the uh, U.S. history. And uh, there's nothing light about this book. It's uh, you know, it's like it's this thick, and uh, it's a long, long read. If you get it in Audible, it's about 40 hours of reading it to you. Your average business book is six or seven hours. So, anyways, um, I really like this concept. Well, the basic idea is: let me gather together all the people who we competed to become president. And all, why should we waste all these brains? Let's bring them all together and learn how to work as a team. Now, how good they worked as a team, that's, you know, up for grabs. But um, this is sort of the idea is that we got to learn to pull together. It's not us against you. It's not, it's not our country against that country. It's not this political party against that political party. Uh, 
Uh, we all should be paying attention to how do we make this a better world and what does that mean? You know, let's get some basic understandings of what, what's important. This is sort of why, so 20 years ago, when I switched to just working purely in software development, I'd already been programming for 20 years. And uh, I realized right away that the problem wasn't the technical stuff. Matter of fact, there's something Llewellyn Falco said to me. Maybe you need to check with him if he would allow this. He said, uh, yeah, these technical problems are really difficult, but people are impossible. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know where he got that from, but if he made that up himself, I think it's brilliant. This is sort of the issue is that impossible thing is the only reasonable place to, to focus. Um, I've worked with some teams that technically uh, could probably have done anything, but they couldn't work together. And that's why I think, you know, mob programming exists today because I was open to the idea that there's got to be better ways to collaborate. I didn't just mm -hmm. didn't know it would be mob programming. Mm -hmm. We were just learning how to be with each other, how to listen to each other. How We were actually studying those things, how to share our ideas, how to try each other's ideas. Let's be willing to do that. And then somebody, you can always find somebody on the team who will take a big book like this and read it. So you don't need to have everybody read the book. Every one of these books, if, if we just had one person on the team pick a different book and each one read it, then we could bring that knowledge into the team. That's mm -hmm. a great, that would be a great uh, exercise to try. Right. So there you go. Did we cover too much stuff? You're going to need to cut some stuff out probably. No, we're good. No. This is excellent. If I could yeah. start my life over again, that's sort of what you were saying earlier. I can't think of anything I could have done that would have gotten me to where I ended up except the path that I went down. You know, it's like, what's that famous saying that the path, the path not taken, taken. or whatever? Mm -hmm. the, the, the basic story is it doesn't matter which path you take. That's basically what that poem is about. It doesn't matter. Each one is going to bring its own future for you. And you can't ever look back and say, should have done this or should have done that. There we go. That's a great way to close it out. <laughs> I had a great time. Thank you for inviting me.